My lecture today is based on ongoing research I'm conducting towards my dissertation in anthropology and ethnomusicology. <coughs> my dissertation project, like today's lecture, um, looks at the centrality of sound and audibility in contestations and anxieties over politics, religion, regulation of public health, and management of urban space in Mumbai. I focus in particular on the phenomenon of so-called noise pollution. The blower, please. What's that? A little louder. A little louder, sure. In Mumbai and other city, Indian cities, the designation of noise pollution, as it appears, for example, in newspapers, public health literature, or legal discourse, is somewhat idiosyncratic in terms of the kinds of sounds deemed to be significant pollutants. While the Indian Central Pollution Control Board has found that motor vehicles constitute the greatest contributors to noise pollution in Mumbai, other sound sources often draw more attention in public discussions about noise. Sources which are totally distinct from those indexing high-density urbanism, like vehicle horns or construction sounds. In Mumbai and Indian city, cities in general, a major point of debate uh, over noise pollution involves high-decibel sounds originating from religious and political events. In the pages of major newspapers and in the rooms of the Bombay High Court, one can regularly find heated debate about sound emitted from loudspeakers stacked high on flatbeds during Hindu festivals or mounted at the top of mosques to play Azan, the Islamic call to prayer. Indian cities, therefore, present a situation in which noise pollution and the conflict surrounding it has manifested not solely as a byproduct of urban and infrastructural circumstances, as is often the case in large metropolitan areas across the globe, um, but rather as a phenomenon arising in large part from the cultural and political spheres. My project focuses on Mumbai in particular because, aside from being recognized as India's loudest city, Mumbai also stands out for having a remarkably vigorous community of anti-noise pollution activists. My most recent trip to Mumbai was largely spent with these activists, especially Sumera Abdullahi, founder of the NGO Awaz Foundation, who has been monitoring decibel levels in Mumbai since 2003. Abdullahi, like most of the activists I've met, specifically requested that I use her real name rather than a pseudonym. During my last trip to Mumbai, I conducted interviews and participant observation research during activist day-to-day -day activities. These activities include things like taking decibel readings during festivals and political rallies, filing public interest litigation with the Bombay High Court concerning noise levels during those festivals and rallies, um, recording and compiling noise complaints from private individuals, meeting with government officials and journalists, and working on various public, public relations and awareness projects like designing print ad campaigns with advertising agencies and attending relevant professional conferences. The work of Mumbai's anti-noise activists will largely be the focus of my talk today. I'd like to be clear from the start what my project is not about. Last September in Mumbai, I attended a conference on noise pollution at Nair Hospital, hosted by the hospital's audiology department. A professor from the department delivered the conference's opening remarks. She suggested, only partly in jest, that noise pollution exists in India because Indians are, by nature, loud people. <laughs> this is a sentiment that often gets expressed in anti-noise circles, and one that, of course, I vigorously disagree with, along with the essentialist view of culture upon which it is premised. I do not in any way seek to demonstrate with my project that Indians are loud. Um, offering a similar interpretation, one of the key anti-noise pollution activists in Mumbai, Dr. Yeshwan Oak, once wrote the following. Indian culture is essentially very noisy. There's no parallel in the world to the noise pollution generated during festivals and religious celebrations in India. Another point is uncivilized social environment in which our children are brought up. We spit and put red spray after chewing pawn and tobacco anywhere on road. We urinate and at times even defecate in public spaces at our convenience. The worst part is we don't feel much ashamed of our behavior. Perpetrators of noise always feel that people around should bear with them though inconvenience, such as our selfish thinking. While I admire Dr. Oak, Dr. Oak, and we agree on many things, I strongly disagree with his perspective that high decibel levels in Indian cities are the result of any kind of cultural essence or social deficiency. Rather, in this lecture, I hope to show that the decibel levels in Mumbai and other Indian cities are, in part, the result of complex factors that have politicized Indian urban soundscapes. I really had a lot of fun like just Googling the word noise, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> uh, the word noise is generally used pejoratively. It's characterized as unwanted or disturbing sound, and frequently employed in contradistinction to the category of music. This is a dualism that I wholly reject, and I personally find the concept of noise itself to be highly problematic, as of course sound that is unwanted to some may be pleasurable to others, um, which is often the case in the situations that I examine in my project. 
Still, I use the term noise throughout my project as it reflects the language used on the subject in the context of Mumbai's popular and legal discourse. For me, the formal qualities of a sound will never render it unmusical or noisy, and I have no, no interest um, in engaging in what I see as a futile conversation about what sounds constitute music and what sounds do not. I'm also not personally averse to high decibel levels, and in terms of aesthetic preference, I actually really like a lot of the music I hear in Mumbai in the context of contentiously loud events which sometimes leaves me in disagreement with some of the activists I've worked with. My interest in noise pollution debate, then, is based in an ethnomusicological perspective from which I want to highlight a situation in which sound, often musical sound, in the sense that it's deliberately produced by human actors, has come to play an uncharacteristically crucial role in public discourse, popular political expression, and governance. Hindu festivals represent one of the most significant, if not the most significant, objects of attention from Mumbai's anti-noise activists. The largest and typically loudest public processions and other events during a given festival are generally organized directly by political parties or by mandals, local planning committees, um, which are at times affiliated with a political party um, and at times have members with considerable influence in local government institutions. While political parties from across the spectrum frequently organize or sponsor events, processions or pandals during major festivals, it seems to me that Hindu national parties like Shiv Sena are especially visible and active. Um, the connection between soundscape issues and festivals is what made me interested in the noise pollution debate to begin with. That's because festivals seem to exist at a unique nexus of religion, politics, and urban infrastructural and logistic issues, as large public festival celebrations demand alternate modes of movement and time management in Indian cities. Festivals and the sound from festivals are what drives a complex and perennial confrontation between ostensibly apolitical activists with public health or environmental concerns about noise and political figures, sometimes even regional and national party elite. I'm just going to show a few very short videos that I took. Some of them are like super short um, from festivals. That's a like, noise meter, by the way, that you see there. I took this while riding in Sumero's car. <laughs> Same with this second one. Okay, I'll play one more. It's a little bit longer, but I took a few years ago in Nagpur. Play button. <laughs> oh, there it is. threat uh, to political parties. According to the informants I spoke with, 
Major festivals are of indispensable value to political parties who view them um, as an ideal means to consolidate popular support by accessing and appealing to substantial vote banks, especially among lower income urban populations. Festival processions um, organized by parties and bundles are also typically very loud. They seldom remain under the legal limit of 65 decibels during the day and 55 decibels at night in commercial areas and 55 decibels during the day and 45 decibels at night in residential areas and very often pass through designated silent zones around hospitals and schools where the daytime limit is 50 dB and the nighttime limit is 40 dB. Larger processions more frequently average out somewhere in the 80 to 110 dB range, occasionally exceeding 120 dB um, based on my experience as well as decibel reports issued after major festivals by the Monterostra Pollution Control Board. I'll discuss decibel measurements in a bit more detail later in my talk, but for now it suffices to establish that technically speaking, uh, festival organizers routinely violate the law when it comes to noise regulation, um, a law which stipulates a penalty of one lock, which is 100,000 rupees fine, and or five years in prison. Um, so pretty steep penalties there. Interestingly, though, uh, none of my informants had ever heard of this penalty ever being issued, um, even in instances where evidence of violation was shown in court, and even when this evidence was provided by government officials, like pollution control board officials or police officers. However, this doesn't seem to deter anti-noise activists from regularly filing litigation against parties and bundles, um, and they do at times achieve small legal victories like blocking the issuance of permits for loudspeakers at public events. This is enough to make them a considerable thorn in the side for party leadership, um, and it's not uncommon to find political party leaders directly addressing activists like Abdullahi when quoted in newspapers. If public festival events were ever silenced, in a relative sense, by the legal efforts of anti-noise activists, it would drastically hinder their utility to political parties and have a huge impact on the political campaign process. The political potential of religious festivals was recognized as early as 1893, when Balgan Ghadar Taluk, the Maharashtrian nationalist leader, initiated the first publicly celebrated Ganpati festival, in large part as a vehicle for political expression under the pretense of religious observation. In 1896, Tilak also organized a festival for the Maratha king Shivaji, whose image has become a popular symbol for Hindu nationalism, perhaps with dubious historicity. Before Tilak's involvement, Ganesh Utsav was celebrated much less publicly. Religious festivals became useful for nationalists as they presented an opportunity to organize large-scale public events that otherwise might not be permitted by the British colonial government, which often suppressed outright political assembly. Incidentally, many historians have now come to view Tillich's efforts in festival organizations having a distinct anti-Muslim character. Tillich's involvement in the history of the public Ganesh Utsav um, is not merely esoteric trivia. I was amused by this image that appeared at the Nair Hospital Audiology Department event I mentioned earlier, um, which depicts a contemporary Ganpati plugging his ears from the amplified sound from loudspeakers while Tillich watches over the 1893 Ganpati with approval. One of my informants, uh, Dr. Mahesh Bedekar, said of Tilak and Ganpati that, quote, he wanted Indians to come together so they can be exchange of dialogue regarding British rule. He said that people are divided out here, so how can we come together? If I come to them for a speech, they won't come in such a big number, but Ganpati is such a thing, Maharashtra. When it became public, then people started coming together. Bedekar is a gynecologist in the Mumbai sub sub suburb of Tane who runs a maternity hospital founded by his grandfather. He became involved in noise pollution activism because of frequent wedding and festival processions passing by his hospital, which he says became a disturbance and health risk for his patients. Regarding festivals, he told me, quote, unfortunately politicians come to know this is something which is untapped, and if a politician wants to become famous, it was very easy for him, in the name of religion, you can gather people. Dr. Baedeker emphasizes that he is a Hindu who follows every festival, and he, that he is absolutely apolitical and not connected to any political party. I spoke with Dr. Baedeker about the lack of implementation of existing laws limiting decibel levels, which he attributed in part to insufficient awareness of noise laws among police officers. The rules are in place, he said, but nobody's doing anything. To my surprise, the courts give very good rulings, but police are not knowing about it. I also asked Dr. Baedeker why other hospitals tend not to get involved with noise issues, as a concern for patient well-being drives many of the arguments that I've heard being advanced by anti-noise activists. He suggested that hospitals remain silent when it comes to noise because of their substantial reliance on municipal corporations and other local government institutions for basic operation. This reliance makes them vulnerable to political parties and politically connected bundles who have an interest in continuing to organize loud uh, festival events 
and who may be able to arrange undue scrutiny and withholding against hospitals that challenge them. Baedeker referred to this as political interference and said of hospitals that, quote, nobody is ready to talk anything against politicians. Politicians will say they're against us and see to it that our permissions are not given. Another one of my informants, a high-ranking police official in Mumbai, with reference to Gunpati festival celebrations, suggested that Gunpati Mundal members often use their political ties to put indirect and even direct pressure on police not to enforce noise pollution laws. He mentioned, for example, incidents of false allegations made against officers who did attempt to penalize Mundals for organizing events that exceeded legal decibel limits. Ajay Marate, an anti-noise activist in the suburb of Navi, Mumbai, offered another perspective on police non-enforcement of noise laws. He suggested that the reason police do not book or punish noise violations is that they, quote, maybe they want to keep their book very clean in terms of crimes booked. In other words, ignoring noise violations, which are relatively innocuous as far as crimes go, gives police officers a way to improve crime statistics under the pressure of scrutiny from superiors, politicians, and the public. Marate told me that once someone files an FIR, which is a first information report, with the police, Officers are obliged to investigate. He argues, however, that they do so very, very rarely, and that at times um, the person that has filed the FIR has to go to court just to get police to act on it. Several informants insisted that festival organization is often highly lucrative for Mundals and their members. Dr. Yeshwan Oak, who I quoted earlier, had the following to say about festival Mundals. See, basically, if you analyze why, these excess, why this excessive festival noise is happening, basically festivals are money-making things. These mundals are multi crore Because of festivals, because of noise, they have a lot of sponsors, and they collect so-called donations by force. They'll go to a shop and say, you have to pay a 1,000 rupees. Two days back in Pune, there's an eatery where people were dining. Three Ganpati mundal men said to the proprietor, give us a 1,000 rupees. So the owner said, I'll give you 500 now, and I'll give you 500 later. They beat them up. They ransacked the whole place. So basically, it's extortion under the guise of religion. I generally take all this with a grain of salt, since most of my informants up to this point in my research have been very firmly opposed to festival mundles, um, and though I respect them, it would be irresponsible to rule out the possibility of substantial bias. It is worth noting, however, the frequency with which I've heard stories like this, at times from more neutral parties like police officers and journalists. For example, while sharing a taxi ride with me last October, a Hindustan Times reporter told me about an instance in which someone who complained about festival noise got beaten up uh, by people from local Mundal responsible for the events in question. At one point during my last trip, I decided to share a post on a Facebook page called Citizens Noise Map, where Mumbai residents can go and share their decibel readings from various locations across the city and unofficially register noise complaints. My post served as an explanation of my research and an invitation to participate in my study as an interviewee. I left my phone number and email address for inter interested parties to reach me. The first phone call I received in response to my post came from a woman in the Grant Road area of South Mumbai who claimed that she had been repeatedly harassed and intimidated by members of the local Gunpati Mundal. She asked me to join her at her local police station where she was to file a formal complaint. When I got there, I was surprised to find several members of the Mundal who she was filing against were also present. Um, the Mundal in question, she told me, is a small-scale one not, not affiliated to any political party though they do collect donations from local shopkeepers and residents during the festival. This informant alleged that Mundal members bribe police officers to neutralize complaints like hers lodged against them. She also claimed that one of the older Mundal members that was in the station with us works for the BMC, which is the Bria Mumbai Municipal Corporation, um, and uses his position as leverage in various local contexts. Another person that contacted me in response to my Citizens Noise Map post made similar allegations having to do with corruption and intimidation from festival mundal members. This informant, who lives in Juhu, said that, uh, quote, these are all goon-led festivals. These are, they hire local goons. They will not say they're goons. They're political workers. They're affiliated to some political party. They're also the same guy who charged people for putting up stalls, illegal stalls, and hawkers on the road. They charge money for them. So I know these guys. I've lived there for 50 years almost. So last year, it got too much, and I walked across the road and said, listen, can I see the permission you have to play music here? And this big goon came up to me um, saying, who are you? And who are you to ask me for permission? So I went to the cops, and nothing happened. They said, we'll ask them to reduce the volume. I said, but how did you give them permission, give them permission for them to put up a stall right in front of a hospital? No reply. Last year, it got a bit scary because these goons, they know where you stay, and they can start to come and trouble you. So my family said, 
back off. This is just half a day. We'll put up with it. But why should you? There's definitely sample bias at work in my use of the Systems Noise Map page as an informant recruitment tool, um, since, of course, the people most likely reached by my post um, are those already most inclined to complain about noise. They are, after all, visiting a Facebook page to do just that. But the stories are interesting and valuable nonetheless, I think. While some of the anti-noise activists I spoke to are motivated primarily by concerns for ecology, animal rights, or other issues, most activists from uh, frame noise pollution as a public health issue first and foremost. In fact, quite a few of the more prominent anti-noise activists in Mumbai, like Dr. Oak and Dr. Baedeker, are medical doctors or public health professionals who allocate their free time to activism. Many activists have therefore adopted a strategy of emphasizing the injurious health effects of high decibel sound. This is demonstrated in these promotional materials used by the anti-noise NGO OWAS Foundation to address automobile noise, specifically the honking of car horns, which many of us know as a technology used in an altogether different way in India than in the West. Their campaign blur reads, the Indian habit of honking produces unhealthy levels of noise continuously 24 hours a day and 365 days a year, causes diseases like heart disease, mental health illness, and even cancer. Noise affects every organ in the body adversely and is a serious medical problem. Our campaign seeks to establish the dangers of honking on health by making honking itself a disease. We tell people about the ill effects of horn flu and how they can save themselves from it. It speaks to them in a complete medical and serious language. To what extent are these kinds of claims about noise being made by activists medically accurate? How loud are Indian cities really, and how loud is too loud? Um, so I put this little chart together based on information I got from the American Speech Language Hearing Association and the Centers, Center for Disease <coughs> Control, um, both of whom basically say that anything above 85 decibels can cause permanent hearing loss, depending on the length of your exposure to it. Um, so anything that's like above 90 decibels, um, which is the equivalent of like a subway or, or a passing motorcycle, they recommend a two-hour limit to exposure. Um, Whereas something at 120 dB, like a jet plane taking off or an ambulance siren, they say nine seconds of exposure um, is the, their limit. Um, something at 140 dB, like firearms or a jet engine, can cause immediate hearing damage. This is this chart um, from the Maharashtra Pollution Control Board from the 2013 Gunpati Festival, um, where they sort of chart out the various locations that they took decibel readings. Um, saying that their average high was uh, 92.7 decibels, their average low was 54.6 decibels, which is like a little bit lower than what um, the activists usually measure, uh, possibly you know, depending on like where people are standing, taking the readings and stuff like that. Um, there are you know, laws on the, on the books having to do with noise um, the Environmental Protection Act in 1986 reclassified noise from being a nuisance to a pollutant um, and specified that penalty that I mentioned earlier for violations up to 100,000 rupees fine and five years in prison or both. Um, and more recently, the noise pollution regulation and control rules set the decibel limits that I mentioned earlier, um, including those for silent zones around hospitals, schools, stuff like that. Uh, this is from a 2011 World Health Organization study that basically um, is graphing uh, hearing loss in children with income uh, by country. Their argument being that there's a relationship between, uh, between a country's income and uh, the prevalence of hearing loss in children. Um, here you can see that hearing loss in children is nearly five times as prevalent in South Asia as in high-income regions like the U.S. or Canada or Australia or Japan. Um, and I do actually, there, will, there isn't specific data on this in their report, but I do wonder uh, to what extent um, India is driving up that number in South Asia. I'd be curious to see the numbers for other countries in South Asia that they compiled. This map is basically saying some of the same stuff in map form, um, though it's for all ages, not just children. As the 2011 World Health Organization study suggests, there seems to be a relationship in many cases between hearing loss and economic factors. 
While everyone theoretically experiences the material force of high decibel sound more or less the same way, the duration of exposure is often connected to socioeconomic factors. In Mumbai, over half the city's total population lives in informal housing or slums. Such housing structures uh, have much greater sound wave permeability, thereby offering significantly less hearing protection to residents inside. Prolonged exposure to street level noise therefore disproportionately threatens the health of those with less access to money and therefore formal housing. Furthermore, as Subarendra Kumar notes, the age group most heavily affected by hearing loss in India is children ages 5 to 14, and for children with parents of low income economic background, the risk of hearing loss is greatly increased. While in Mumbai, I interviewed and observed administrative uh, staff and technicians working with the audiological charitable trust ORED, um, which offers free hearing screenings and treatment, mostly for children. Um, I asked ORED's director, Aziza Tiakji Hyderi, if she could offer me any statistical data regarding how many children that come into ORED experience hearing loss as a direct result of noise exposure, um, but she told me that they don't record that data. She did tell me, however, that on a case-by-case -case anecdotal basis, she knows of concrete examples of individual children treated by ORED who are experiencing hearing loss due to noise exposure. She also pointed out that most children with hearing loss from noise exposure don't ever seek treatment. I went with ORED technicians while they conducted free hearing screenings for school children using their mobile audiometric equipment housed in the van pictured here. In observing these screenings, I was surprised to note that over 40% of the children screened were being referred to ENTs and audiologists for further analysis and treatment because they presented um, some evidence of hearing loss based on autoacoustic emissions testing, OAE. Um, one of the technicians told me that in the case of children with low income, income economic backgrounds, um, the likelihood of parents actually taking those children to ENTs or audiologists is uh, pretty low. Um, I think that the number of children presenting evidence of hearing loss in this case uh, could be slightly inflated due to some of the circumstances in which they were screened. For example, OAEs may not be as accurate as other audiometric tests and are usually used in neonatal contexts. Also, um, a hearing screening conducted in a van parked in a loud neighborhood uh, will not yield as accurate of results as one done in a soundproof room. So to be cautious, I would emphasize that this 40% that I mentioned were showing enough evidence to be referred for further examination and not being diagnosed with anything on the spot. I also joined ORED's technicians while they conducted a series of mobile hearing screenings as part of a joint project with the WAS. This project involved going to a local police station and offering free hearing screenings to all officers present. The hypothesis being that traffic police might experience abnormally high levels of hearing loss due to frequent and prolonged exposure to both automobile and festival noise, as traffic police are routinely assigned to accompany festival processions. The ranking officer at the station was highly amused and accommodating. He ordered every officer in the station, 17 in all, to line up for a screening. The results, for what they were, seemed to support the hypothesis. Six out of 17 passed the screening, while 11 out of 17 were referred to audiologists or ENTs for further testing. I would, of course, qualify these results in the same way as those in the case of the children's hearing screenings. Um, in fact, these results could be even more compromised due to the fact that partway through the screenings, the van's air conditioning stopped working, and so the remaining OAEs were done in a car. Um, still, the numbers are very high, so I don't think these other factors totally refute the findings. Medical anthropologists Lauren Schell and Melinda Denham, <coughs> writing about urbanization and public health, note that noise can have adverse medical consequences beyond just hearing impairment, mostly having to do with psychological and cardiovascular impact of stress. Stress from noise, they write, can affect the endocrine system, especially the adrenal gland. <coughs> Endocrine-related effects are systemic and affect such basic function as basal metabolic rate, response to injury, which is tissue repair and inflammation, um, reproduction, growth and development, and mentation. Unquote. But I'm sorry, continuing the quote. The strongest evidence for the cardiovascular effect of noise has been the study of blood pressure and occupational noise exposure. Positive relationships between noise exposure and hypertension or blood pressure have been reported repeatedly in the literature. Quantitative data at a local level in Mumbai relating to the non-auditory effects of the noise are basically non-existent. Furthermore, as Davies et al.'s 2009 article on occupational and environmental medicine finds, in general, air and noise pollution can lead to some of the very same adverse health effects, um, so it's often impossible to attribute causation to one or the other on its own, especially since the two tend to co-occur in urban contexts. Notably, though, in 2015, the International Institute of Sleep Sciences in Tane, uh, the Mumbai suburb, uh, reported an increase in the number of people seeking help from the Institute for issues having to do with inability to sleep, 
ascribing this increase to environmental factors, which include noise pollution. As I approach the end of my lecture, I'd like to discuss anti-noise activism as it relates to anxieties about religious community and communalism. The genesis of my dissertation project was my master's <coughs> research on music before mosque violence during the late colonial period. In brief, this phenomenon involved violence, typically between groups of Hindus and Muslims, over the performance of music in procession, often during Hindu festivals, in public areas just outside mosques during prayer time. There's some important parallels between this colonial phenomenon and contemporary discussions about noise pollution, which are often permeated by language alluding to communalism. This becomes clear when public discussions about noise bring the sound from Hindu festivals into relation with the sound from amplifiers used by some mosques for the call to prayer. Of all the anti-noise activists in Mumbai, Abdulali is probably the most prominent and likely receives the most journalistic coverage. Her relatively high profile, perhaps in conjunction with the fact that she is a Muslim, often seen taking decibel readings at <coughs> Hindu festival events and submitting that data to the high court, repeatedly make her the focus of criticism from certain Hindu nationalist political party leaders. For example, um, a newspaper in 2010 alluded to Abdulali's involvement in a case against Shiv Sena, writing, quote, stung by the proceedings initiated by, uh, for violating decibel limits during the Shiv Sena Ducera rally here Sunday, the party Wednesday hit back, asking why action was not being taken against noise pollution created daily by loudspeakers in mosques. An editorial that ran in Samna, a Rocky <coughs> newspaper published directly by Shiv Sena, um, uh, addressed Abdulali directly in asking, is she not disturbed or bothered by the loudspeakers blaring from the mosques? In 2014, um, VHP, Vishwa Hindu Parashad, the Hindu nationalist organization, explicitly called for a ban on loudspeakers in mosques in Maharashtra. VHP central committee member, Vyankatesh Afdeo, was quoted in the Hindu as saying, quote, the year-long noise pollution caused by mosques is overlooked, but people are going to court to ban the use of loudspeakers during the Hindu festivals like Ganpati and Navratri, which have a limited duration. Abdul Ali responded to these criticisms in a 2015 lecture, saying, Every year around Gunpati time, I start getting emails and Twitter messages and texts from people saying, you're only active during Gunpati. What about the masjids who, are, who start making noise around 5 a.m. every day? And what about, and every year, my answer is the same, that I've taken noise readings of masjids. I put them before the court. The government of Maharashtra has filed an affidavit stating that it's going to ensure that masjids do not make noise. The Supreme Court of India has filed, has passed an order that religion is not ground to violate noise rules. The party that organizes the maximum number of Ganpati Pandals, after I measured noise during the Sarah rally of that party, made a statement that I should measure noise at the masjids first. And I said, um, I have done that. I have gone to court. I've got the orders. You're the party that controls the BMC because you're the elected party in the corporators, and it's up to the BMC to have those loudspeakers removed. Why has your party not done it? Is it the job of the party, or the person in charge of the BNC, or is it the job of an NGO? So I'd like to say again that noise cuts across every religion. It's a health issue. I think everybody here knows it, but it's been made into a political issue, and the only way to break that very strong political input in, uh, into noise is to turn it into a health one. Marathi and Baedeker, both Hindus, respond somewhat differently to public pressures to take more decibel readings at mosques. Baedeker told me that his measurement of festival decibel levels has been met with um, a, lot of a lot of opposition from politicians, from some Hindu organizations like Shiv Sena, who say, why are, you taking, why are you talking only about Hindu religion? Why don't you talk about the loudspeakers on mosques? He responds by saying, I'm talking about Hindu religion because I celebrate those festivals and I feel they are not the way we ought to celebrate. I cannot talk about Islam. I don't know anything about Islam, but I'm sure that religion doesn't say you should shout on loudspeakers. But as a Hindu, I feel my festivals have been totally hijacked by politicians. Ajay Marate, who has filed complaints against mosques in Navi Mumbai, where according to a 2014 right to information request, 45 out of 49 mosques were using loudspeakers without a permit, also expressed apprehension about taking decibel readings outside mosques. He says he fears a negative reaction if he were to be seen with a decibel meter outside a mosque, since as a non-Muslim, he wouldn't want to be accused of, an of being anti-Muslim and that measuring noise levels outside a mosque uh, might make it seem like he has a problem with Islam. When it comes to noise levels from sources having to do with religion, he tells me it's better that it comes from within, i.e. a member of that particular religious community. My research on all this is still in process, um, and I plan to return to Mumbai this September to keep working, thanks to the support of the Center for South Asia and the Scholarly Activities Small Grants Fund. I definitely welcome your feedback and suggestions. Thanks. Thank you.